So no winter lasts forever and no spring skips its turn. Uh, and you, we don't need a calendar to tell us what's going on out there. Uh, you know, we can just smell it, feel it, you know. Charles Dickens had said this. It was one of those March days when the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it is summer in the light and winter in the shade. That's from Great Expectations. Uh, it's been like that the last few days. You notice, especially near the end of the day, you know, you can have summer, you can have winter, just wherever you stand. And everything seems possible in spring. It's got this great expansive quality to it. Uh, there's movement, there's energy. Um, and there's this feeling of promise. And if you look even a little deeper, you might even feel that there's a possibility for redemption. Uh, I like Thoreau's uh, line. He says, in a pleasant spring morning, all sins are forgiven. I'll take that. So this energy is happening. And so tonight I want to talk a little bit about how our practice can uh, embrace this energy, kind of utilize it in some way. And I'll start with Mary Oliver. I rose this morning early as usual and went to my desk. But it's spring. And the thrush in the woods, somewhere in the twisted branches, and he is singing. And so now I am standing by the open door, and now I am stepping down onto the grass. I am touching a few leaves. I am noticing the way the yellow butterflies move together in a twinkling cloud over the field. And I am thinking, maybe just looking and listening is the real work. Maybe just looking and listening is the real work. Well, she's talking about mindfulness practice. Just being with what is. Very simple. Just receiving the flow of experience, whatever it might be. Allowing our senses to be as open as we are able to have them open. Sometimes they're shut down a little bit. But this is the very heart of our practice. And spring, it, spring doesn't affect everybody the same. Um, and I've been noticing some things my, myself. Um, there's all this energy, all this movement, and with that comes a certain amount of uncertainty. Uh, this is from uh, Elizabeth Bowen. And she says, it is in this unearthly first hour of spring twilight that Earth's almost agonized livingness is most felt. Agonized livingness. The hour is so dreadful to some people that they hurry indoors and turn on the lights. Now that's not the usual reaction to spring. But with this kind of dazzling energy and changeability that's going on, um, there could be a little reticence to, to take full participation in this kind of explosion of, of activity. Because uh, spring does, it calls us out of uh, whatever space we're in. It pulls us out. This indrawn energy that we've at least I know I have, kind of gathered up over the, over the winter. Agonized livingness. I, and curiously, I, usually I'm a go-getter in spring, but this time there's just something about it that has me a little... Um, maybe the winter was so severe uh, that I just went in further and further and further, and then... I think I had three teaching gigs, three retreats, te all of them up north. And it was just dark and snow and, you know, 
meditating, and, you know, it's just further and further in. So I'm not sure I'm quite ready for spring. And maybe it's the requirements of spring. Uh, my landscape requires a lot of energy. And I can, you know, very soon, I better have it in my, you know, it feeling a certain responsibility to all those plants. So, so winter has demands, uh, you know, uh, spring has demands that winter really doesn't, doesn't ask of us. And this, this practice we do has a kind of similar, has a similar movement in it. In the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, which we've talked about uh, a few times, um, it's uh, the Buddha's discourse on really what the practice is about, how to meditate from kind of soup to nuts. It's maybe the most important discourse that he gave, at least a lot of people think it is. Um, and in that, in that sutta, he teaches us to, to look mindfully both within and without. To abide contemplating phenomena both internally, our thoughts, our feelings, our body sensations, etc., and to abide contemplating phenomena externally, sights, sounds, touches, tastes, smells. And in that exploration externally, my reading of the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, I, I can really feel in it he's asking a connection asking us to connect with others, with our environment, participating in some way. And so in addition to just being awake to what's going on inside and outside, what the Buddha also stressed in this Satipatthana Sutta was to pay attention to change, to notice it wherever it's found, and of course, it's found everywhere. So paying attention to what's happening, paying attention to change, these are foundational aspects uh, of the practice. And the Satipatthana Sutta talks about it because you know, my, the challenge I, uh, that I'll always offer is find me something that doesn't change. You know, stuff comes, it goes. And spring happens to be a great time for feeling into this change. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's an explosion going on. And so, boiling down this practice is to just, in a, with equanimity, with some level of calmness, just notice change. Notice it everywhere, internally, externally. When you think about the seasons, uh, as, as spring morphs into summer, it's not so dramatic. There's just this kind of bright spring green that changes to a little darker, and there's the flora and fauna change a little bit. First there may be fireflies and then the gladiolas. You know, you can mark it with all the things that happen. Same way from summer into fall. Certain leaves begin to change. If you notice, poison ivy is one of the first ones. It starts to turn yellow. I know I have some cherry trees that they drop their leaves at the end of August. I don't know what that's about, but they do. And then the hummingbirds start to leave in September, and then we, the temperature starts dropping, and there's a little bit of a frost, and then you move into winter. It's slow and subtle, but spring isn't like that. You know, it just comes right at us. This is from Langston Hughes. Nobody can, nobody can keep spring out of Harlem. I stuck my head out of the window this morning, and spring kissed me bang in the face. I mean, that's just the way it is. It wasn't more than like a week or so ago. We're like, we're all still watching the weather reports for the next blizzard. And now it's like, whew, still some snow around, but bang in the face. So spring has this kind of juicy sexual quality to it. Um, 
it's nature in full throttle. And you just watch it everywhere. I was watching the birds today chasing each other around. I knew what they were doing. You know, right out in public. So just putting our attention on this activity of spring, of nature in full bloom, uh, there's a lot of benefits involved in that. When we're putting our attention on something in, in nature, and especially in spring, watching and feeling all this energy, there's a few things that we're not doing. In that moment, when we're paying attention to that daffodil or that little grass that's coming up or watching the birds and noticing a new species of bird coming in. What we're not doing in that moment is we're not worrying, we're not planning, we're not rehashing our, our life, we're not fantasizing, we're in that connected presence. And that itself is restorative for the mind, the heart, and the body. That's what all this research that's going on is is proving and showing over and over. You just spend a little time in what's happening right now. Feeling the chair on your tush, feeling the sound waves come over you, the touch of your hands wherever they're resting. Um, it's so simple and yet so beneficial. So we're tuning. If we just direct a little attention, we're tuning into this fabulous energy. And with that, that can trigger some dormant aliveness in us. We can kind of harmonize our human instrument with this movement of, of nature. And there's energy in that. There's a, and, then, and with that energy comes a rising, can come a rising joy. And if you fold that into some meditative training of your parasympathetic nervous system, that's a nice combination. That energy, that joy, that calm, that's what the practice is training our organism toward. In fact, in those moments when we're absorbed, uh, Shinzen Young always would use the phrase, mystical schmistical, he'd say. In those moments when we're really absorbed, I mean, that's a moment of, however you want to say it, touching the source, ultimate reality, God, emptiness. You know, that's a moment when our sense of self, this separate, embattled self, isn't so much there. If you notice that, if you're really paying attention. This is from uh, a poet named John Moffat. To look at anything, if you would know that thing, you must look at it long. To look at this green and say, I have seen spring in these woods, will not do. You must be the thing you see. You must be the dark snakes of stems and ferny plumes of leaves. You must enter into the small silence between the leaves. You must take your time and touch the very peace they issue from. You must be the thing you see. That's a real connection. So if we can slow it down, stay with our senses, linger a little bit, an awful lot gets revealed. In those moments, the ego gets out of the way, temporarily. But we get a vacation. When that connectedness gets enhanced like that and the boundaries start to melt between inside and outside, we really can discover what, what that phrase, intimacy with all life is, intimacy with all creation. It's just available in the next moment. Yeah, and you may you may spend significant dollars on great entertainment and music and really cool vacations. I know I do. You know, 
and what are we looking for in, in those situations? What do we want out of those experiences? We may want some joy. We may want some relaxation. We might want to fire up some of the wonder that maybe has gotten a little tarnished, a little novelty, some aesthetic appreciation. And nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if I'm honest with myself, if I'm applying myself to these little situations of my environment fully, um, there's a great joy in that. And it's a different kind of joy. It's a very simple, purified, uncomplicated uh, uh, joy. It's, um, it's when the ordinary becomes extraordinary. And that's through our mindfulness practice. And so we don't need a huge bank account to lead a really rich uh, life. So we've got this spring. And so we're talking about now absorbing into the external environment. And what's interesting to do is to toggle back and forth as we kind of direct our attention to, to this energy that's happening now. And then occasionally bring it back in and look and see what's up inside in relation to this. What has been touched or enhanced? You know, in this, we can call it a spring communion experience. We have the opportunity uh, in this absorption coming back inside, to touch into those, what I'll call the beautiful emotions. The emotions that aren't available all the time. They're not available because they're veiled or covered over with our wanting something or not wanting something, restlessness or agitation or lethargy or doubt, these classic hindrances that we talk about. But in those moments, if we're toggling back and forth in our direct experience with nature, we might, dis we might discover and rediscover some of that awe. They're actually doing research now on awe as something that's hardwired into us uh, out at Berkeley and some other places. It's very interesting. You know, what, 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 what is hardwired into us that gives us goosebumps when we, when we hear something that touches us? It's in there. And it's these deeper, beautiful processes that are available to us when these coverings, these energies can relax a little bit. And along with that awe, well, of course, there's love, there's compassion, there's joy, and there's peace. Uh, the Tibetans call it the great natural perfection. It's just there all the time. And occasionally the clouds part and we get a little taste, a little feel for it. And we practice and, uh, and we have certain things that we do um, to enhance the possibility of touching, touching into that. And the more that we can toggle back and forth like that and touch in, we're re-engineering our nervous system. It's like that little bit in the instructions that I'm finding out to be you know, helpful and important. That moment when the mind comes back, when we wake up, to just hang out there. Just notice, I'm awake. I'm not worrying, planning. I'm not off in some fantasy or story. And this is, this is real life and awakening right now. Um, it's the same way we train like this in using spring and nature as as kind of a touch point, and then we touch inside. We notice what, what if there are the, any of those beautiful emotions there, that sense of mystery or awe or compassion or love, and just notice that. We're so quick in our culture to like want to jump to all our problems, all our flaws. Oh, I'm a this or a that. But in those moments when we're really, when we somehow drop beneath the clouds, just notice 
hang out there because that's training our nervous system to, to fall there more as a default. Because that's who we are. This other stuff, you know, it's kind of running here and there. But that's who we are, and we know those moments. Now, granted, sometimes whatever's, whatever the conditions are, our internal anguish or existential uh, angst uh, may be too strong. You know, we're not going to be able to touch in and absorb into the little flower that's growing because we're just, just whacked in that moment. We're lost. We're identified. But the practice is the same. Can we bring in those moments when we wake from that identification just for a moment and we still may be anxious and kind of thrown around, can we bring a kindly acceptance to that too? Can we say yes to that? You know, with the same understanding that, hey, this isn't any more permanent than any of this other stuff just isn't you know so it's that watching change and also gives us confidence that uh, everything's going to change if we don't like it it's changing if we like it it's changing also you know one of my one of my spring moments of melancholy and I watch it and year after year now I've got about 12 varieties of peonies you know I probably talk about this every spring and it, it's just such hard work to plant them. Uh, one, of my, one of my expert neighbors down the road, he had me dig two foot wide by two foot deep holes, fill them with all this amazing stuff for each plant. It about killed me. <laughs> but they're beautiful, and they grow huge. But they only bloom for a brief period of time. And so it's just, you know, and I watch them, and I, I was out there today looking at did they start? Did they come out of the ground? Not yet. <coughs> and then there's the time, you know, they're in full bloom and flower, and I'm just, ah, and the smells, and they're all over the house, and I give them away. And then there's the time when they start browning up. And I'm looking, is there any more? And then there's this kind of, you know, this wanting to hold on to the pleasant, wanting to maintain it. But nature doesn't work like that. It's just not the deal. We don't get it like that, Those, you know. And um, and then it passes, and I notice that you know this the sadness, and um, I can get sad just thinking about it now. <laughs> They're just flowers, you know. But I'm remind it it reminds me of that the, the fourth of the Buddha's five daily recollections, and it's a hard one. I mean, it's like right between the eyes. Everything dear and delightful to me will change and vanish. But that's the flow of nature. Everything dear and delightful to me will change and vanish. But embedded in that is a kind of urgency to wake up. Pay attention. These people in our lives aren't going to be around forever. You know, reach out and hold their hand. <laughs> It's all very precious, and it all moves really fast. So, you know, the Buddha didn't mince words about stuff like that. A poem. Uh, I'm sure I've uh, read this poem here, but I like it. It's just so appropriate. It speaks to this wanting to control things, wanting to wanting to hold on to those peonies and make them bloom forever or to push away everything we don't like. And it's called Allow. It's by uh, Dana Falls. She lives over in the valley. There is no controlling life. Try controlling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild with the weak, fear, fantasies, failures, and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness veils your vision with despair, 
Practice becomes simply bearing the truth. And the choice to let go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to your new eyes. So that's our, that's our challenge to allow and then allow some more and to touch into this precious spring. How many more are we going to have? We don't know. For one or more of us, this could be our last spring. Just because you're young, don't think that you might be out of that uh, out of the queue, so to speak, because we don't know where we are. So I think I'll, I think I'll stop there for now. And um, I'd like to hear if anybody has special ways that they enjoy spring, that they could share, and that maybe we could each pick up a few new tricks. What is it that might turn you on or that you like about it? comes to mind. And maybe we all can notice a little more. They bloom for 50 or 60 years or longer. Thank you. Yes. Our baby birds, <laughs> human baby birds, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful, I mean, we're not outside of nature. We're all just rolling in it together. And their instincts are still such that they just want to be on the ground, you know. They're connected. Yeah. So the next time I see young people on the ground, I'll notice that connection more. Thanks. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what they're eating now. I guess there's a few things that are starting to bloom. Not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, bees, you know, coming online. Hope they make it. They're having some trouble, some of the varieties. Yeah. That gives me the chills. 
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I guess for us around here, if the ground freezes, there's those first smells of when it starts to thaw, you know. Um, yeah. Thanks. Part of the mystery. Yeah. How many spring babies do we have here? I'm just curious. Well, we got a few. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. A little, a little louder so they can hear it on this side. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Yes is the only living thing. You know, I took my dog, Maruta, <laughs> for a walk. And um, when we walk, he can run out in the countryside and spring and take sips of all the water and the mud and everything he can. And put him in the car and took him back home. And then when I got back in the car about an hour later, I was searching the little food section in front of me. And I realized that it was the loneliness of mm. the earth and the water that he brought in oh, the nice. car. And I was sitting there mesmerized, actually. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. so smell for me is the loneliness of, of the earth is, um, is the thing that fascinates me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Take your dogs in the mud. Look at the <laughs> benefits. <laughs> now the smell will still be there. It's just nice to have more daylight. Michael. I've seen you there. <laughs> Sweet. Teresa, yeah, yeah.
Well, you're a bird expert. So, I mean, my I'm not an expert, but my experience is this is a time of year where they seem more active than any other time. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Okay. All right. Well, it is 9 o'clock. Uh, thank you. And for those who are interested, come to Sojourners. You don't have to make all of the five uh, classes, and each one will have a different focus, and the discussions will be very rich. But sign up on the web so you get the directions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.